Hey brothers and sisters, Grooms here. Um, I've got audio I want to play for you guys. Uh, the quality is kind of uh, sketchy, but it's very powerful. And uh, just try to pay close attention to it the best you can. Uh, this is all about crazy stupid things that pastors say and uh, let's just get it started what's the cure for this by the way Romans 14 5 be persuaded in your own mind you will not be deceived about wrong doctrine when you're persuaded in your own mind about what the truth is I don't mean you just have a strong opinion I mean you go to the Bible to study what it says be persuaded in your mind about what God teaches in scripture the Bible. and when you're persuaded you will be guarded against silly things and people just seeking you uh, as their prophet. Paul says he wasn't seeking the Corinthians for their possessions. He wanted to see them grow. Even if it meant losing them. He says, the more I love you, the less I be loved. Right? That's the proper motivation of ministry. But meanwhile, a lot of folk theology, a lot of Facebook theology, a lot of just cultural theology that may not be biblical starts from bad preaching. And so those who listen to preachers ought to be able to evaluate this. That's how you segregate the good ones from the bad ones. Right? You don't give to, you don't listen to, you don't endorse those who are bad. Right? But meanwhile, silly things preachers say. God told me to preach this message this morning. That's why I'm doing it. Silly. Right? Where, where's the amen after that? The Holy Spirit led me to talk to you this morning about this. I had something prepared, but it was from my own mind. The Holy Spirit led me to teach something. Really? Doesn't that sound pious and holy? Doesn't it sound like I'm a spiritual man? Because the Holy Spirit leads me wherever I go. And he led me to say these exact words. And you pray, God, lead me, give me the words to say. So that now every word that I say is God's words, right? No, not exactly right. right. The silly things preachers say, God told me. And you know, when preachers say it, people say it. That's what happens. You heard your friend say this? Well, God told me to do this. The Holy Spirit leads me to do this. Where'd they get that? It's not from the Bible. Is it real? Really? The place where they get it from preacher talk is Matthew 4, verse 1. The only place in the Bible you find an example where the Holy Spirit is leading someone somewhere is Jesus into the wilderness to face the devil. Whoops. Now, I'm not trying to impugn the Holy Spirit. You who are sons of God, you are in Christ, are led of the Spirit. Romans 8, verse 14. Okay? You are led of the Spirit. Does that mean everything you do is holy and divine? No, of course not. It means if you are saved by faith in the gospel, if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, if you're a member of the body of Christ, your duty, your obligation, your leader is what God would have you do with that spirit inside of you. You see, that's what that leading means. It doesn't mean you get your magic stick and go, where is he taking us? We don't know. That's not it. Okay, as so you read the Bible and you hear what God would have you do, that's what God's leading you towards, to be conformed to the image of Christ. Okay? That's how people use it. People use it over all sorts of silly things. I was walking down the street, heading for McDonald's, and God like a burger king. And that's why I found someone to talk to, you know. How do you know that? Well, I had an unction. <laughs> that's, the, that's the Christian word for something in my gut, you know. That's not what the word means, necessarily. But those are silly things people say, because they want to sound spiritual. Right? And well, it starts with the preachers, by the way. Matthew 4 1, the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the devil. And Romans 8, 14, of course, you're led of the Spirit. If you are saved, you are, aren't you? Then you are. The Spirit speaks through His Word. People say, well, how does the Spirit speak to me? Well, He speaks to you through the Bible, folks. He wrote this book. These are the Spirit's words right here. And he helps you understand that when you read them, you have to read them and study them. You can't outgive God. I mentioned that before. This is the thing preachers say. Look at Luke 6, 38. Reach down deep this morning, folks. You can't outgive God. God promised that if you just give him what is rightfully his, then he will open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. You can't even contain what God's going to give. You can't out give God. You give a little bit, he'll give more. He won't let you be the most giver. You know, he'll give a little bit, even a little bit more. And he'll give more. What does Pat Robertson wrongfully teach on his show? What was the 700 Club? That very thing. You give 10, God will give you 100. You give a thousand, God will give you ten thousand. God will multiply. The principle of multiplication, right? It's fancy. The doctrine of multiplication. 
It's wrong. It's silly. It's not in the Bible. Malachi 3, well, i got to be careful there. Malachi 3.10 talks about those windows of heaven being opened up under the covenant to Israel. Talk about literal storehouses and literal tithes in a literal nation. Look at Luke 6.38. Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. Wow. So there it is, folks. You give, God will give back, pressed down, running over. He gives more. By the way, it's interesting why you don't have to press down your measure and have it running over. What is that? You go to Greek. People always use this verse to say that God's going to give you more. Right? God is telling the disciples in Luke 6 and Luke 12 that if they sacrifice now, they will receive rewards. Matthew 20, 28, he promises them thrones in the kingdom. He says in the kingdom they'll receive a hundredfold, tenfold for what they give up now. Peter says that we've given up wives, we've given up families, we've given up you know, careers. Jesus says he'll be given back, rewarded in the kingdom. There's a principle of reward, but you know what? God's best for you may include suffering. It may include you not having things. So the idea that you're going to be blessed and you can count in your budget God giving you more back before you retire is a silly thing. It's just a silly thing. It causes people to turn away and flee from Christianity in the Bible because they think we're all about money and we're, we're greedy trying to get all their money, and that's just not right. Okay. So let's pray for these people. Everybody just bow their heads. Everybody, every eye closed, every head bowed. But no one looking around. Raise your hand so I can count how many people have put their faith in the gospel this morning. <laughs> Nobody had their eyes closed. I don't know why you didn't. When the preacher says something, they'll obey. But we all know that the deacons, the ushers, and the children never bow their eyes. Right <laughs> close their eyes. I never did. The preacher said that. I'm looking around. You know, eyes closed. What does that mean? <laughs> Trying to figure it out. Why do they say silly things like that? Why do they say things to motivate people to come up front? Okay, recently there was a, a, a little uh, rebuke against, uh, was it Steve Burdick, one of those guys down there at uh, one of these mega churches down in the Carolinas, where he wrote a, a, an instruction manual about how to get people baptized spontaneously, how to have spontaneous water baptisms. Now, of course, if you water baptize, you have to come down front where the water baptism pool is. So how do you get people to come up front? You learn a lesson from Billy Graham on this. How does Billy Graham and those people come down from the upper deck? How does it happen? Well, you plant people in the audience, and when they say the key word on the stage, those people who are planted stand up and start walking down so everybody sees them. And suddenly, now maybe someone who was on the edge, that will get up and start walking away. That's how you get people to make that choice, right? And so every eye closed, every head bowed, the intention there is that, look, you're safe. Nobody's going to see you do it. Come on, just make a decision. I've got to report this to my denomination head. Five decisions this week. Because that's what counts, right? It's manipulative, right? And it's deceptive, and it's silly. Why don't you, why don't you tell people that they can where they're at, put their trust in the gospel for their salvation, and they can be saved? Because now, suddenly, I wouldn't know if you made that choice or not. And now I don't know if anybody's saved. <laughs> so, now i got to say, hey, everyone with their eyes closed, walk down the aisle, and we'll see what happens. That just won't work, will it? Just silly. So for the sake of trying to count heads, to count people, to count attendants, they say silly things. Okay? It's just not a right thing to do. I heard someone say recently, praise and worship is practice for eternity. You ever heard that? Praise and worship is practice for eternity. Amen, brother. Let's have more praise and worship, more practice for eternity. Right? Well, that's good for the band, I guess. Right? That's what they're doing for eternity. Who said eternity was that? You know, that comes from that idea where you're on the clouds with the harp, you know, you're playing God, music for God the whole time. We have a job to do, not only now, but in eternity. The Bible describes. And you know what our preparation for that is? Our ministry now. Not praise and worship, but church. He said, we'll just be glorifying God 24-7 in heaven. Myth. Not true. Now, you'll be to God's glory. Don't get me wrong. God will be glorified by you because he saved you by his grace and you're in Christ. It's the only reason why you have a position in him. So God gets the glory forever through Jesus Christ. But it's not because you hit the notes and you're a good harmonizer. Right? That's not why he gets the glory. That's a little different than chariots of fire, isn't it? Right? Run for God's glory. I'm not going to be doing that for eternity. And he gave us an ambassadorship duty so that we minister for him and we learn about how to serve him. We learn about judgment in eternity and how to minister in eternity, serve him in eternity, by how we do that now. Standing on the truth, proclaiming his word, okay, submitting to authority, so on and so forth. 
So this is our practice, our life, our ministry now. Not just a 30 minutes of praise and worship. So it's kind of a silly thing. I know they're trying to encourage people, hey, praise and worship is a good time, it's a fun time, it's what we're doing with God for eternity. Well, not exactly true. But the intent is good. You see silly things preachers say? God's perfect plan for your life. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, All who live godly will suffer persecution. God's perfect plan for your life. It includes persecution. That's not what people think when the preacher says, God's perfect plan for your life. Nobody thinks God's perfect plan for my life is, you know, looking at the gas station when I'm 75 years old. But that may be a noble thing. Maybe a good thing. And yet, the perfect plan for your life, the idea that people are looking for something better in their life, and preachers want God to be that better thing. And so they say, God has a more perfect plan in your life. Why don't you, I don't know, give to him? Spend time with him? Come to church to be with him? Right? About three silly things I said there. You are the church. Right? And he's in, he dwells in you, Colossians chapter 1, Christians 3.16. God has a perfect plan for your life. God has a perfect plan. <laughs> Whether you're in or not depends upon your faith. Whether you get a part of what God is doing depends on you submitting yourself to God. Okay, your faith in the gospel. His, his will for you is, is for you to be saved and then to get involved with what he is doing. Your sanctification, verse Thessalonians 4. It says his will is your sanctification. Sanctification means your separation from this world to serve him. Which typically, when people talk about a plan for their own life, they're thinking about how can I live life to the fullest in this world. Well, the only way you can do that, folks, is by giving up your life and serving the Lord. And that's not something people like to hear. But preachers say silly things when they try to say things to people like, God wants to do things for you. you know, God's up there just waiting to do things for you. You just have to ask him. Which I said, face palm. You just have to ask him. What? So he, he's up, the God of the universe is up there going, I'm so excited, I want to do something for him, I want to do something for him. Just ask, just ask. Like a magic genie. You've got to rub the lamp first. There you go, God. I wish. No, that's not what God's doing. God has done things. He has offered salvation to the world. He's given eternal life through Jesus Christ. And he wrote it in a book. And he's preserved it for you. Now you have to respond. God has amazing things in store. If you just ask him, that comes from John 14 where Jesus said, ask whatever you wish in prayer and I'll do it for you. Right? Whatever you ask in my name. Now, of course, he's given covenant instructions to people filled with the Holy Ghost who would not ask things according to their lusts. But never mind that. Preachers say silly things. God wants to do things for you. Because you may be feeling alone and insecure and like nobody likes you. But God loves you and wants to do things for you. And he's waiting for you. If you would just open your heart's door and ask him to come in, he'll sit down inside your heart and you can live his perfect plan for your life. Silly things. Something worse than that is God desires to be in your plans and in your life. You ever heard that? God desires to be in your life. Wow. He desires to be in my life. Yeah, he wants to be in your life. Just make time for him. Make room for him. The Bible teaching is a little more clear. It says God wants you dead, and he wants to take over your life. How's that? It doesn't preach well, you know? It's hard to do that. It's harder to preach that. You can't preach it. It's harder to preach that, though. People like to hear that God desires to be in my life. My life. You know, it's going okay, but maybe God can help. Because that would be in my life, my plans. By the way, you know the song Joy to the World, right? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. What's the next line? You don't even know what it was the song. <laughs> <laughs> but every 